Well, good afternoon, brethren. It's good to see uh, everyone on the Sabbath day. It is wonderful to be able to get together, even though we're all fall, far apart with the miracles of technology, that we can all be together and worship our Heavenly Father together on this Sabbath day. I'd like to start off, as I always do, giving a shout out to some very special people to Daisy Swint, to Gene Ward, to Nancy Miller. Hope, Nancy, you're doing very well. And to Bruce Metzger in San Antonio, and Teresa and John down in Monterey. Feliz Sabado a ustedes in Mexico. It's good to uh, have all these people that were able to get together by the internet today. Well, brother, many years ago, I used to be the choir director here in Houston. And one of my favorite choral pieces that we performed as a choir was They Shall Soar Like Eagles by Laura Manso. It was a beautiful and meaningful piece of special music, and it also has a wonderful flute solo. The opening words of the song are as follows. They shall soar like eagles, rise up and soar like eagles. They who wait upon the Lord shall not be weary. They shall never sorrow but gain new strength and power, they who wait upon the Lord. You know, the words of the song are a paraphrase of Isaiah 40 and verse 31. Please turn with me to Isaiah 40, and we'll read this section of Scripture. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31. Isaiah 40 and verse 31. Isaiah wrote, But they, sh they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Now, brethren, this is a beautiful song taken from a beautiful verse in the Bible, which has much meaning for us today, just like it did almost 2,750 years ago when Isaiah wrote these words. But have we ever stopped and pondered exactly what does it mean to wait upon the Lord. What does it mean to wait upon our Heavenly Father? Brethren, in my sermon this afternoon entitled, What Does It Mean to Wait Upon the Lord? I would like to explore four points concerning the deep meaning of this phrase and how waiting on our Heavenly Father requires action on our part which has deep implications and ramifications in our spiritual lives and ultimately our eternal salvation our, and, and our entry into our Father's kingdom. Again, to begin with, we must be, define our terms. This is so very important no matter what the subject in our biblical studies is. We have to define our terms. Without defining our terms, anything can mean anything. And any word or phrase can mean whatever we have heard for decades, not testing if that meaning or connotation is actually correct. You know, in defining our terms, there are two main verbs in Hebrew used in the phrase, wait upon the Lord, or wait upon Yehovah. The first Hebrew verb is kava, Q-A-V-A-H. Q-A-V-A-H. It's Strong's number 6960, which appears in the PL form of the verb. The PL form in Hebrew is the emphatic form which shows intensity. According to Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew Lexicon and Strong's Concordance, the verb kava in the PL form means to wait or to look eagerly for, but waiting patiently for. The phrase, wait upon the Lord, using this verb, kava, occurs 23 times in the Old Testament. Let's reread Isaiah 40, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord, they who look eagerly and patiently for Yehovah, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Please turn with me to Psalm 37, and we will read a few other verses in the Old Testament which use this verb, kava, and this phrase. In Psalm 37, in verse 9, David 
wrote about waiting upon Yehovah. Psalm 37 and verse 9. David wrote, For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon Yehovah, they wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. He's saying those who look eagerly and patiently for Yehovah shall inherit the earth. Please turn with me to Proverbs 20. Solomon, as well as David, had much to say about waiting on Yehovah. In Proverbs 20 and verse 22, Solomon wrote, Proverbs 20 and verse 22, Say you not, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save you. Look eagerly and patiently for Yehovah, and he will save you. Now, the second Hebrew verb translated as wait is chaka, K-H-A-K-A-H, and that's Strong's 2442, which appears in the PL form of the verb, again showing emphasis and intensity. And according to Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew lexicon, the verb chaka in the PL form means to wait or to long for or to yearn for. The, fr the phrase, wait upon the Lord, using this verb, chalka, occurs five times in the Old Testament. Please turn with me to Isaiah 30, and we'll read a few of these five verses in the Old Testament using this verb, chalka, and this phrase. Isaiah 30, verse 18, actually uses this verb twice. Isaiah 30, and verse 18. Isaiah writes, And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore he will be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you, for the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. Now, Isaiah 30 and verse 18 in the New American Standard is translated as, Therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are those who long for Him. Again, there's an emphasis and there's a connotation of longing for, not just waiting, but longing for Yehovah. We read this also in Psalm 33, verse 20, where David wrote, Our soul waits for the Lord. Our soul yearns for Yehovah. He is our help and our shield, for our heart shall rejoice in Him because we have trusted in His holy name. Please turn with me to Isaiah 64 and verse 4. Isaiah 64 and verse 4. A very familiar verse. Isaiah 64 and verse 4. Isaiah wrote, For since the beginning of the world men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither I, neither has the eye seen, O God, beside you, what he has prepared for him that waits for him. Again in Isaiah 8 and verse 17, we have another verse. Isaiah 8 and 17, just back a few, pa uh, few pages in the Bible. Isaiah 8 and 17, Isaiah wrote, I will wait upon the Lord that hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Now an interesting point, Isaiah 8 and verse 17, is that this verse contains both verbs, kava and chalka. The verb wait in the verse is chalka, and the verb look for is kava, pretty much having the same connotation and meaning. Therefore, this verse could be translated, and I will yearn for Yehovah, who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will eagerly look for him. You know, in the New Testament, the phrase wait upon the Lord is not found. However, there are clues to a different way to connote a similar meaning of the phrase in Greek 
as it was in Hebrew. A major clue is found in 1 Corinthians 2. Let, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 2, and we'll read verse 9, where Paul writes the Corinthians concerning our incredible, indescribable future that we will share with God the Father and Jesus Christ in our Father's kingdom. 1 Corinthians 2, and we'll read verse 9. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. Paul writes, But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of a man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Now, brethren, if that verse kind of seems familiar, it is because Paul is referencing Isaiah 64, verse 4, which we have just previously read. The Greek verb at the end of the verse that Paul used in his reference to Isaiah 64, verse 4, is the verb hagapao, A-G-A-P-A-O. In Strong's number 25, this verb is the verb form of the noun hagape, which is Strong's number 26, which we all know to be that special godly love that God the Father and Jesus Christ have for us. It is interesting that the Apostle Paul uses this verb in referencing Isaiah 64, verse 4, because in reading the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, the verb in the Septuagint is a different verb than the verb that Paul used. So Paul is not directly quoting from the Septuagint, whereas many other references to Old Testament scriptures in the New Testament are almost direct quotes from the Septuagint. This is important because Paul is showing the Corinthians an inspired interpretation of the Hebrew verb into Greek. According to Thayer's Greek lexicon, the verb hagapao means to love selflessly in the way that God loves, but the verb can also mean to welcome with desire or to long for. And that's the connotation that, pa that Paul is using in using this verb. So Paul is telling the Corinthians in Greek in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9 by his own translation of the Hebrew verse of Isaiah 64 verse 4, but as, as it is written, eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God, Hotheos, God the Father, has prepared for them who love Him and long for Him, who yearn for Him. Hence, there is a harmony between the Greek and the Hebrew texts. Other verses in the New Testament which have the, this verb, hagapao, with this special connotation include the following. Please turn with me to James 1. James chapter 1, and we'll read verse 12. James chapter 1 and verse 12. James writes, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him, or lovingly long for him. James also writes one chapter later in James 2 and verse 5. James chapter 2 and verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which He has promised to them that love Him, or longingly lo long for Him, who lovingly long for Him? Another Greek verb which closely follows this co same connotation of the two Hebrew verbs, kava and chaka, which we studied earlier, is the verb apedekomai. A-P-E-K-D-E-K-H-O-M-A-I. That's A-P-E-K-D-E-K-H-O-M-A-I. Apodekomai. And it's Strong's number 553. According to Thayer's Greek lexicon, this verb apodekomai means to diligently, patiently, and persistently wait for. Strong's Concordance states that the verb means to await eagerly, to eagerly look for. Let's read a few verses which utilize this verb, apodekomai. Please turn with me to Luke 12, and we'll read about Jesus' teaching 
about diligently awaiting and looking for their master. Luke 12, and we'll begin in verse 34. A teaching of Jesus Christ to his disciples. Luke 12 and verse 34. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And in verse 36. And you yourselves like unto men that wait for Abedekomai, eagerly await and look for their Lord when he will return from the wedding that when he comes and knocks, that they may open unto him immediately. So they're waiting eagerly and looking for their Lord. Please turn with me to Mark 15, and we read about the actions of an honorable and righteous man after the death of Jesus. Mark chapter 15, and we'll read verse 43. You know, Joseph of Arimathea was a very righteous man, and he... He was risking a little bit, uh, risking a lot, and asking for the body of Jesus. Mark 15 and verse 43. Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, who also waited for Abedekomai, eagerly awaited and looked for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. He was eagerly awaiting and looking for the kingdom of God. You know, brethren, in all these verses in the New Testament, which have either of these two Greek verbs, hagapeo or apedekomai, the verbs appear always in the middle voice, which connotes that the action is that the action is being performed on the person, as well as it being an active verb, too. So it's a, it, it's a combination of being active and passive. The use of the middle voice with these verbs show the internalization of these actions and these mindsets and attitudes of the brethren performing the action. These verbs in the middle voice do not connote waiting as in waiting for the bus or waiting for your meal to come at a restaurant. These verbs go much deeper in meaning and point to a spiritual condition which requires patience, endurance, humility, and faith. So in both Hebrew and Greek, the term for waiting connotes an intense, emphasized longing for, and yearning for, and earnest expectation for something. They are all actionable verbs. They're not passive verbs. So, brethren, in discussing further the term waiting on the Lord, I would like to explore four points concerning what is required to wait on our Heavenly Father. The first point concerning waiting on our Heavenly Father is waiting on God the Father requires patience. Point number one, waiting on God the Father requires patience. We've all heard the humorous anecdote about the man praying for patience. And in the prayer, he prays, Lord, give me patience. And please give it to me right now. Brethren, when we ask our Heavenly Father for patience, does He just miraculously give us patience? Or does He provide us with situations and circumstances in which we develop patience? How many times do we pray and ask God the Father for patience? And then when He provides that opportunity to grow in patience and to exhibit patience in our lives, we turn around and we get angry at the things that things are taking too long. We get angry at the situation or at the person causing the delay, the delay or even at the Father Himself for not acting to alleviate the situation. This dichotomy is at the heart of waiting for our Father. Brethren, our human nature wants and demands instant gratification. Our society is founded on that desire. Marketing and, television, uh, marketing and advertising on television, radio, and on the Internet all blast out very effectively that we can have it right now. We can have it all right now. In times past, people had to save money 
in order to buy things that they desired. Today, we want it, and we want it now. So we buy everything what we want now, have instant gratification. We put it on a credit card with money that we don't have. And consequently, the average American is heavily in debt, continuing to amass things that he wants instantly without having to wait and to save for the purchase. I'd like to show you three graphs, one which illustrates Satan's way, one which illustrates man's minimum expectations and desires, and one which illustrates the way of our Heavenly Father. Now, the first graph that I have here, I'm going to try to use some, some uh, graphs in the sermon. The first graph shows Satan's way of instant gratification. There are two axes on the graph. The horizontal axis is time, and the vertical axis is action. Now, in this first graph, as this graph shows, the desired action or outcome is, is achieved almost immediately. That's what we want. We pray about something, we have a desire, and it's immediately fulfilled. Right there. That's what we all want. The line extends vertically next to the vertical axis. No time passes, and we receive exactly what we want. This is how most of our prayers are prayed. And that's the desired outcome, and that outcome would, would be that it would come immediately. Now, the second graph shows what we would normally accept as a minimum. The, the line extends at an angle and shows that there is progress being made all the time. We see a little progress come, and we pray some more, and a little bit, we, we see that there is progress being made, and what we're, our desires are being achieved over time. We can see that the Father is blessing us as we continually climb toward and approach our goal or desire. Now, my third graph fell on the floor. However, the third graph shows that God the Father offers us this most of the time. And what this is, is His schedule. It's His way, not our way. Not our desires, it's His will. The, Scott, the time schedule is based on His will and not our will. So we pray. We pray more. We pray again. We diligently pray and nothing seems to happen. We pray more. Nothing seems to happen. We pray again and again and again and nothing seems to happen. Then we begin to become disillusioned, disheartened. We become disappointed. Then, you know, about somewhere around in this time, nothing's happened. We start getting bitter. We start getting even angry. And sometimes we even get angry at our Father. Does this sound familiar in your life? This is the way that God operates with us so many times in our lives. You know, an example in my own personal life involves my wife, Martha, and me. You know, I didn't get married until I was 32. I lived all my 20s in search of getting married. I wanted to get married just like everyone else was getting married. But nothing ever worked out. I wanted immediate, immediate results. By the time I turned 31, I was still unmarried with no one on the horizon. I grew angry at the Father. I remember having angry conversations with him. I felt that he was just not hearing me and that he apparently didn't care about my plight. I felt like life was just passing me by. You know, I used to play racquetball often with an elder in the church back in 1990. You know, and our matches would always turn into counseling sessions about why I wasn't married. I finally came to the point that I gave up on what I was so adamant about in finding a wife. And I finally told the father that if he wanted me to remain single the rest of my life, then I would serve him as a single person and I would accept it. Something I didn't really desire, 
but it's something I finally accepted. And after a racquetball match with that elder in the middle of August of 1990, I informed the elder of my decision and my acceptance of my fate. And I still remember verbatim what he said to me. He said, Mark, I think you're ready. And I predict that you will be married within a year. And I predict that you will marry an ambassador or college graduate. I was shocked. I actually told him that I really wanted some, some of what he had been smoking. That was the furthest thing f that I was ever thinking about. Uh, within a year? Sure enough, two weeks later, two weeks later, I met Martha at a singles weekend in Dallas. Long story made short, I married Martha on July 7th, 1991, less than one year after that racquetball game. And Martha was an Ambassador College graduate. And brethren, in four days, we will be celebrating our 30th wedding anniversary. What I wanted in 1990 was the first graph, immediate action and fulfillment. What God the Father had been giving me was the third graph, a whole lot of waiting and then very quick fulfillment. Please turn with me to Genesis 15. Abraham did not realize that his life following Yehovah meant the process in graph number 3. Genesis 15, starting in verse 1. Genesis 15 and verse 1. After these things, the word of Yehovah came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me you have given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of Jehovah came unto him, saying, This shall not be your heir, but he shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if you be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall your seed be. Now Abraham believed Jehovah, but he misunderstood that the promised seed would actually be through his wife Sarah. So he fathered a child through Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar. Abraham took matters into his own hand and actually did not wait on Yehovah. Then Yehovah made the impossible possible and let the impossible happen and let Sarah become pregnant with Isaac when she was 90 years old. 90 years old and she's pregnant with Isaac. And Abraham was 99 years old. That, brethren, is graph number three. Please turn with me to Genesis 41. We looked at this example in my last sermon, but the story of Joseph is a perfect example of graph number three. After approximately 11 years as a servant and as a prisoner, deep in the bowels of the prison, Joseph was unbelievably and miraculously extracted and elevated beyond his wildest dreams. Genesis 41 and verse 38 this is where the Father fulfills everything very quickly. Genesis 41, verse 38. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a man, such one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed you all this, there is none so discreet and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and according unto your word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Again, Joseph woke up that morning as a prisoner in the bowels of the prison and went to bed that night in the Pharaoh's palace, second in command of all Egypt. Brethren, in the coming days and weeks, my challenge to you is to make a list of additional biblical characters who had to show patience when nothing seemed to be happening for an ex extended period of time. And then, all of a sudden, the biggest unimaginable 
blessing comes unexpectedly out of nowhere and is basically dumped in their lap. Include in this list all the times that this has happened to you or to your family or to someone that you know. Then when you are becoming disheartened by a seemingly unanswered prayer, take out this sheet and review it. It really truly is an attitude adjuster. Brethren, waiting on God the Father, yearning for Him, longing for His coming, and the coming of His Son requires patience. Are we showing that patience as we trust Him that all will work out in the end? The second point concerning waiting on our Heavenly Father is waiting on God the Father requires endurance. Waiting on God the Father requires endurance. Please turn with me to Matthew 24. Jesus was prophesying on the end time events surrounding the end of this age. Jesus gave a specific warning to the brethren, the called out ones of his Father. In Matthew 24 and verse 12, Jesus gave a warning. Matthew 24 and verse 12, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. As explained in my last sermon, the Greek verb for love in verse 12 is, or the Greek word for love in verse 12 is hagape, A-G-A-P-E, which is the Greek word for the godly love that emanates from God the Father and from Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. The verse is talking about brethren who have God's Spirit. This is a warning to the brethren who have been called by God the Father, who have found favor with the Father and been given favor by the Father, who have been given the Holy Spirit by the Father. And this warning is that many will allow that godly love to turn cold. Then the very next verse says that those brethren, those called out ones by the Father, who endure unto the end shall be saved. The Greek verb for endure here is hupomeno, H-U-P-O-M-E-N-O, hupomeno, is Strong's number 5278, which means to endure or persevere. Please turn with me to 2 Timothy 2. Brethren, are we experiencing trials and ill treatment by others in our lives? Paul exhorts Timothy to endure hardness, but he uses a very special verb in, in showing this. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3, Paul writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3, Paul writes, Therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now here in this verse, the verb Paul uses is sukakopatheo. Sukako Patheo, that's S-U-G-K-A-K-O-P-A-T-H-E-O. S-U-G-K-A-K-O-P-A-T-H-E-O. It's Strong's number 4777, which has a special meaning. It means to suffer or endure hardships and evil treatment along with others. Paul is saying that we are all in this together. That we are not to suffer alone, but we are to suffer together. This is why Paul told the Corinthian congregation in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 26 that when one member suffers, all members suffer with him or her. We do not suffer alone. Please turn with me to Hebrews 12. Brethren, just like the, Olympic, just like the athletes in the Olympics, with the Olympic Games coming up, we are running in a race, but our prize is not a gold medal. Our prize is eternal life. We read this in Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Brethren, the Greek noun translated as patience in verse 1 
is hupomone, H-U-P-O-M-O-N-E, hupomone. That is Strong's number 5281, which means patient endurance or steadfastness. This noun is the noun form of the verb hupomeno, which we have discussed in Matthew 24. It's the same verb hupomeno that's used in verse 3 for the verb endure. So we are exalted in Hebrews to run with patient endurance the race that is set before us. And brethren, it's a long race. It's not a sprint. It is a marathon. A sprint takes conditioning, and it takes quick reflexes. A marathon takes conditioning, and it takes endurance. Please turn with me to Matthew 10. Jesus said that his disciples would be hated and would have to endure hardships all the way to the end of their lives. Matthew 10 and verse 22. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endures, hupomeno, to the end shall be saved. We won't turn there, but Daniel warns us in the prophecy in Daniel 7.25 that the entity who will become the beast power at the end of this age will wear out the saints. Satan wants to wear us out, all of us. The Father allows us to be tested to see what we are made of, but the Father will not test us beyond what we can endure. Please turn with me to James 5. James refers to a righteous man who endured incredible suffering but still remained faithful to the Father. James 5 and verse 11. James chapter 5 and verse 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end or the end result of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. God the Father allowed Satan to kill all of Job's children, all of his servants and all of his livestock and cattle. But Job never cursed Jehovah. He instead praised Jehovah. God the Father then allowed Satan to afflict Job with sore boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Job was in total agony. He didn't understand why he was in such agony. He thought he had been faithful and obedient to Jehovah. Why was this happening to him? Have we ever thought the same things in our lives? Have we had these thoughts ourselves? Do we try our best to do everything right and we still have terrible things seem to continually happen to us again and again? Do we ever feel like Job? But brother, Job never gave up. Even when his three friends were saying that all this calamity was because of some secret sin that Job just was not bringing forth and confessing, something that he had committed. Even through that, Job never gave up. Finally, Jehovah explained to Job what was happening. And after Job had endured weeks of terrible, agonizing suffering, Jehovah restored all that Job had lost, and then more. Brethren, we must endure. We must not faint. We must not allow, allow ourselves to be worn down by Satan, by our trials and tests, by this world and by life itself. We are in a race, and in order to finish that race, we must have endurance, all the while yearning for and longing for and waiting in anticipation on God the Father. So, brethren, waiting on our Heavenly Father requires endurance. The third point concerning waiting on our Heavenly Father is, waiting on God the Father requires humility. Another quality and characteristic that we need in order to wait upon our Heavenly Father is humility. Please turn with me to Psalm 34. David wrote many psalms about having a contrite heart and attitude toward Jehovah, toward our Heavenly Father. Psalm 34 and verse 18. David wrote, Psalm 34 and verse 18. Jehovah is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save such as be of a contrite heart, spirit. Please turn with me to Isaiah 66. Isaiah records the words of Jehovah on the type of person upon whom he looks favorably. 
Isaiah 66 in verse 2. Isaiah wrote, For all those things has my hand made, and all those things have been, says Yehovah, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembles at my word. Please turn with me to Micah 6. This famous verse includes three requirements that Yehovah puts upon those who follow him. Micah 6 and verse 8. Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. Micah writes, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what Yehovah requires of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Please turn with me to James 4. James writes that the God the Father gives grace and favor to the humble in spirit. James 4 and verse 6. James chapter 4 and verse 6. But he, God the Father, gives more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. It's an important aspect with our relationship with our Father. Jesus left us a wonderful example of humility to our Heavenly Father's will and His prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane. Please turn with me to Matthew 26. Jesus knew the agony, the incredible suffering that he was going to have to endure in the, in the next few hours, culminating with the excruciating scourging, the agonizing death on the cross. We read this in Matthew 26 and verse 36. Then comes Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane and said unto the disciples, Sit you here while I go yonder and pray. And then verse 38, Then he said unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry you here and watch with me. And in verse 39, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And verse 42, He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, your will be done. And in verse 44, He left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Jesus did not want to die. He did not want to have His body torn open in a vicious scour scourging. He did not want to be nailed to a cross. He asked the Father if there could be any other way. But in the end, He humbly submitted to His Father's will even when the Father's will was that He would suffer and die. That is true humility. Are we willing to humbly submit to our Father's will? Or do we want what we want and what we desire, and sometimes even try to demand that God the Father adopt our will instead of us adopting His will? As we patiently wait for the Father to perform His work in us, do we exhibit the humility that it takes to trust Him, to put our lives in His hands, to let Him mold and fashion us in what He wants us to be, not what we want to be? Brethren, humility is a trademark of those who are truly following the Son and truly following the Father. We just cannot be truly close to our Heavenly Father if we do not exhibit real, true humility with a contrite heart. Humility is a requirement for waiting for, for yearning for Yehovah, our Heavenly Father. The fourth point concerning waiting on our Heavenly Father is, waiting on God the Father requires faith. Brethren, what is faith? The biblical definition is given in Hebrews 11. Please turn with me to Hebrews 11. And we'll read verse 1. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The word substance in Greek is hypostasis. H-U-P-O-S-T-A-S-I-S. Hypostasis. The Strong's number 5287, which means confidence or assurance. The word evidence in Greek is elechos. E -l -e -g K-H-O-S. Elechos. 
and the Strong's number 1650, which means proof or inner conviction. Therefore, Hebrews 11 and verse 1 could be written, Now faith is the confidence of things hoped for, the inner conviction of things not seen. Brethren, do we truly have faith in our Heavenly Father? Do we trust Him implicitly, no matter what the present condition may appear like? No matter how bad things seem and appear right now, no matter what our eyes are telling us that we are seeing, do we still trust and have faith in our Heavenly Father? Please turn with me to Luke 7. We read here about a centurion who knew how authority worked, and we read about his deep faith in Christ's authority. Luke chapter 7, we'll begin in verse 1. Luke chapter 7 and verse 1. Now when he had heard all these sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum, and a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when, he came to Je- when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loved our nation, and he has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, trouble yourself not, for I am not worthy that you should enter into my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto you. But say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having under me soldiers. And I go unto one, say unto one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned to him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great, no, not, no, so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant made whole that had been sick. What is interesting in Luke's account here is that, that I've never noticed before is that the centurion never talked to Jesus. Never met him. Never talked to him. He sent friends to tell Jesus that Jesus didn't need to come to the house. The centurion knew and understood that all Jesus had to do was just to say the words and his servant would be healed. Brethren, that is faith. And it actually seemed to stun even Jesus because he marveled at the centurion's faith. Brethren, do God and the Father and Jesus Christ marvel at our faith? Do we show deep faith in them even when we cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel? Please turn with me to Numbers 14. The, the twelve spies had just returned from spying out the promised land. Ten of the spies gave an evil report, and consequently the Israelites demanded to go back to Egypt. Only Joshua and Caleb gave an accurate, p- positive report. What was the Israelites' reaction? The Israelites' reaction in verse 10 of Numbers 14 was, But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. You know, brethren, the Israelites never believed Jehovah. Even though they saw miracle after miracle after miracle, they witnessed the plagues in Egypt. They witnessed walking through the Red Sea on dry ground with walls of water on both sides. They witnessed manna falling from the sky six days per week. They witnessed water coming from rocks. But they never had a heart to obey and they never had a heart to believe. An unbelieving heart can see, but it will still not believe. Please turn with me to John 20, and we will see that our Heavenly Father wants the exact opposite. Brethren, it does not take much faith at all to believe something if you plainly see it right in front of you. Again, as James stated, faith is believing what you do not see. Jesus mentioned this concept to His disciple Thomas after Thomas had doubted that Jesus had actually been resurrection, resurrected, and he stated that he would not believe until he placed his fingers in the holes of Jesus' hands. We read this in John 20 and verse 26. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. 
Then he said to Thomas, Rich, Reach hither your finger, and be, behold my hands, and reach hither your hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And in verse 29, Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. That's faith. That's what, where faith comes in. Believing in something that you have not seen takes faith. And this is exactly what God the Father and Jesus want us to do. Let's list a few things that we deeply believe in but have never seen. We believe in God the Father and Jesus Christ, His Son. Have you ever physically seen them or heard their voice? We believe that we will be given eternal life at the resurrection and we will enter the Father's kingdom. Is there any physical proof of that? We believe that Jesus died and paid the price for our sins. Do we have any physical proof that He was the Son of God the Father? The Pharisees saw His miracles and didn't believe. So we earnestly believe these things with all our heart and all our being and all of our soul, but we believe because we have faith that they are true. Please turn with me to Mark 9. Jesus was talking with, his fa with the father of a demon-possessed child. And the father's child was at his wit's end. He pleaded with Jesus to have compassion on the child and to cast out the demon. We read Jesus' reply in verse 23. In Mark 9 and verse 23. Jesus said unto him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help you my unbelief. The father's child believed, but he also knew his belief had limitations. He asked Jesus to help him with his unbelief. Jesus did, and the demon left the child. Brethren, when we are at our wit's end, when we begin to waver in our faith, do we ever ask our Heavenly Father to help us in our unbelief? As we yearn for and long for our Father, as we wait for Him to perform His work in us, do we have the faith to endure unto the end? So, brethren, we must have faith in God the Father and His Son, Jesus, for us to please Him and for us to be able to wait upon Him. Brethren, waiting upon the Lord means to eagerly and patiently and diligently look for Him and yearn for Him. Waiting in Hebrew and in Greek are action verbs. They're not passive verbs. Waiting upon the Lord requires action. The four points we covered today are waiting on God the Father requires patience. Waiting on God the Father requires endurance. Waiting on God the Father requires humility. And waiting on God the Father requires faith. Brethren, in closing, I'd like to read a short anecdote that I recently received from a friend. This story goes to the heart of obeying our Father, faithfully fulfilling the duties and the calling that He has given us, trusting Him and having the faith to continue to follow His lead, no matter what the present conditions in our lives may be. Once upon a time, there was a man who was sleeping at night in his cabin when suddenly his room filled with light and an angel appeared. The angel told the man that our Heavenly Father had work for him to do and showed him a large rock in front of his cabin. The angel explained that the man was to push against the rock with all of his might. This the man did day after day after day. For many years he toiled from sun up to sun down, his shoulders set squarely against the cold mass of surface, of the unmoving rock, pushing with all of his might. Each night the man returned to his cabin, sore and worn out, feeling that his whole day had been spent in vain. Thus the man began having the impression that the task was impossible and that he was a failure. These thoughts discouraged and disheartened the man. Why am I killing myself over this, he thought. This is totally futile. He began doubting God and even began to be a little bitter and angry at God the Father. He then prayed, Heavenly Father, I have labored long and hard in your service, putting all my strength to do which you have asked. Yet after all this time, I have not even budged that rock a half a millimeter. What is wrong? Why am I failing? To, the father, to this, the father responded compassionately, My child, when long ago I asked you to serve me and you accepted, I told you that your task was to push against the rock with all your strength which you have done. 
Never once did I mention to you that I expected you to move it. Your task was to push and to push with all your might. And now you come to me, your strength, your strength spent, thinking that you have failed. But is this really so? Look at yourself. Your arms are strong and sturdy. Your back is muscular and tanned. Your hands are callous from constant pressure. And your legs have become massive and hard. Through opposition you have grown much and your abilities now surpass that which you used to have. You haven't moved the rock, but your calling was to be obedient to me and to push and to exercise your faith and trust in my wisdom. This you have done. And now, my child, I will move the rock. Brethren, what rocks does the Father have you pushing against in your life? How many times do we get frustrated and disheartened or depressed because of conditions in our lives? Maybe sometimes we feel that we are just at our wit's end, that we just cannot keep going. Maybe we feel that we're just too tired to keep pushing against the rock. Brethren, for a final scripture, please turn with me again to Isaiah 40 and verse 31, where we will reread the scripture where we started today. Isaiah 40 and verse 31 but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Brethren, let us continue to run our race toward the kingdom of our Heavenly Father. In the days and in the weeks ahead, let us continue to grow in patience, in endurance, in humility, and in faith. Let us be actively pursuing and longing for our Heavenly Father. Brethren, in doing so, we will be laying the groundwork so that we will be able to effectively and successfully wait upon the Lord.